This week's parasha here in Israel is Parashat Shlach, the famous parasha of sending the spies to Israel. And I'm saying this week in Israel especially because in the diaspora they're one week behind and they're reading Behar Otecha, but we're always one step ahead. And this is mainly what we're going to talk about today. This is uh, the parasha that is starting a series of parashot that I call the Lashon Ara parashot. And this parasha, the spies are talking Lashon Ara about Eretz Israel. Next week, we're going to have the famous parasha of Korach that he's talking Lashon Ara about Moshe Rabbeinu. Then we're going to have the parasha of Chukat. Miriam is talking Lashon Ara about Moshe. After that, we have Balak and Bilam. They're talking Lashon Ara and cursing and slandering. So we're going to have a series now of Lashon Ara which I wanted to talk about this today, but we'll talk about that about our, on, our, on our Thursday class about Mashiach, what's uh, holding the redemption. It's this thing that's holding the redemption, by the way. But nevertheless, I wanted to talk about something a little bit more positive. And the theme of the parasha is that Moshe Rabbeinu sends spies to go to Eretz Israel. We've never been so close to Eretz Israel. The camp of Israel, the whole nation is parked three days away from Israel, and Moshe Rabbeinu sends spies to go into Eretz Israel. And before we start, <clears throat> there's a very interesting story that happened about 50, no, about 60 plus, probably even 70 years ago, here in Eretz Israel. It was around the time of the 60s. And there was a very, very strong recession in Israel. Nobody had jobs, businesses went down, economy was crashing, the situation was very, very bad here in Israel. They uh, gathered a few uh, ministers and the Knesset members and they decided, what can we do? I mean, this is not normal. I mean, it's becoming worse and worse and worse. One person said, I have a bold idea. Uh, it might sound completely crazy, but you know what? Uh, that might work. Okay, okay, okay. What, what do you think we should do? He says, I think we should attack the United States. <laughs> what? You want us to attack the United States? He says, I think we should go with our jets, throw some bombs on New York, throw some bombs on uh, Washington, D.C., and they're like, are you out of your mind? You want us to attack the United States? What do you think would be the result? He's like, well, they'll probably come back here with all their aircraft carriers, and they're going to bomb us. They're going to destroy us. And everybody's looking at him like he's completely nuts. And they're telling him, why would we want to do such a thing? So he says, because there's, what's going to happen is, is exactly what they did with Germany. They came in, they bombed Germany completely. Then they uh, applied what's called a martial law, and they rebuilt Germany, and there was never such a thing in history that the economy of Germany went up. Within a matter of a year or two, it was the most powerful and successful economy they ever had. So we should do the same thing. So they're like, huh, that might not be a bad idea. But then somebody stood up in the room and says, but, but what if we win? <laughs> And that's a true story, by the way. This is not a joke. So we think in many times that human nature is that we are afraid to lose. That's what most people think, that we have fear of losing. But the reality is that most people are afraid of winning. Most people are afraid of, but what if I win? Then what? Then I have responsibility. Then I have what to do. I mean, it's not easy to, to win. So you would think that most people are afraid to do something because they're afraid to lose. But the reality is that most people are afraid to do certain things because what if I win? What if I'll be successful? Then what am I going to do? How, can, how am I going to handle the success? So in this week's parasha, it's the first time we meet that the nation of Israel is afraid to succeed. What if we're going to win? What if we're going to actually enter into the land of Israel? Well, what are we going to do with the success? <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, like I told you, the nation of Israel, Am Israel is parked in a distance of a three-day walk into Eretz Israel. 
I spoke about it last year, that if the spies would come back and would not talk Lashon Hara about Eretz Israel and they would tell them the land is perfect, that's, you know when the spies came back? On Tisha B'Av. That's when they came back. If they would not talk Lashon Hara on the 10th of Av, wrap it up, guys, let's pack it. Three day walk, Yud Be'av, Yud Aleph Be'av, Yud Vet Be'av, Yud Gimel Be'av, they would go into Eretz Israel, start the war, Yud Dalet Be'av, build Bet HaMikdash, Tu Be'av, Mashiach is here. Moshe Rabbeinu is appointed to be Mashiach, he's anointed to be Mashiach, that's it, Tu Be'av, is the day when we get the Geula. The Geula. We spoke about it last year, a couple of occasions. First of all, on Parashat Shlach, and I also spoke about it in Tu Be'av, what's a powerful day, Tu Be'av, the 15th day of Av, what they call the Jewish Valentine. But nevertheless, if everything would work as planned, that's it, that would be the day. Instead of that, no, 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 no. We can't go into the land. We get a, a break. No, we can't go in. So, what's the result? of the situation is one of the biggest curse, the sins that we have up until today. So the fact was that the land, the, the, the nation of Israel, they're parked in front of Eretz Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu sends uh, messengers, he sends the spies, and then the worst of all happens when they come back. Besides the Lashon Hara, the worst of all happens. I don't know if you noticed that all the sins that we ever did, especially in the desert, God forgave us. God forgave us the golden calf. God forgave us of every sin. If you go in the pattern, 40 years in the desert, every time God forgives us. This is the only sin He doesn't forgive. He does not forgive, and the worst of all happened. He says, you're all going to die in the desert. You don't want to go into Eretz Israel? No problem. This is going to be a burial. And you know that up until today, we don't even know where they're buried. We're talking about 3 million people. 3, 4 million people. Where are they buried? Isn't there like one big grave in the, in the desert? We don't know where everybody of them are buried. And if chas v'shalom, the Torah would not say how many people they were and what's going on. We wouldn't know anything about that generation. So they send messengers into the land. They come back. They slander the land. Well, no, it's a bad place. We can't go in there. There's no jobs there. It's very, very hard in that land. And, ooh, the, the terror attacks. But nevertheless, they talk. Lashon Rabbar Eret Yisrael. And Hashem says, oh, yeah? You're talking bad about my land? <laughs> no problem. I'm not going to forgive you, and you're not going into this land, the entire generation. Now, like I told you, if you're looking at the pattern in the Torah, Hashem always forgave us. Moshe Rabbeinu was a very good advocate, and we got forgiven. And right away, we move on. And this is the only time that Hashem says, no, you talk bad about Eretz Israel. Here I can't forgive you. And the whole generation gets punished. Now comes a big question. Why did they not want to go into Eretz Israel? What's the big problem? You just suffered 210 years in Egypt. You're walking in the desert now. Well, they weren't walking for 40 years. They were only walking for one year. You're not even. What's your big problem going into Eretz Israel? You have Moshe Rabbeinu with you. You have Hashem with you. What's the big deal? Why can't you go to Eretz Israel? Why wouldn't they want to go into Eretz Israel? They were waiting for years. Can you imagine the promise they had in Mitzrayim? No, 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 don't worry. We have a promise. We're going to go to the land of Israel. Go back 400 years to Avraham Avinu. He was promised to go into Eretz Israel. What's your big deal to go into Eretz Israel? Now comes even a greater question. The questions of all questions that many have asked. And if you didn't ask it yourself, then maybe it's time for you to ask it. What do we need a land? We are called Am Israel, the nation of Israel. Why do we need Eretz Israel? Why do we need a land? What's the big problem? What's the problem that I just, I need a piece of land? Why can't you stay in America? Why can't you stay in South Africa? What's the big deal? I can't be a good Jew in Australia. I can't be a good Jew in Germany. What's the big deal? Why do we need a land? I mean, we're not a type of a nation that is connected to a certain land. Why do we need Eretz Israel? What's the big deal with us as a nation that we need a land? So here, if you didn't ask this question up until now, then ask it. Now you don't have to ask it now out loud. It will disturb the class. Ask it in your heart. But nevertheless, why do we need a land? Why are we waiting for 2,000 years to come back to our land? 
or to be more exact, I shouldn't even say 2,000 years, 1,000 years, 950 years. People round out the exile for 2,000. Oh, if I wait, we have to wait another 50 years. It's exactly 1,950 years. Now, if I'm looking at this big question, then I can ask another big question. What is our connection as a nation to specifically this land? Why can't we go somewhere else? I mean, you know, originally we, should, we were supposed to go to Uganda. I mean, originally, I'm not talking about 2,000 years ago. I'm talking about 70 years ago. And a lot of people say, why couldn't we get like a tropical place? Why couldn't we go to, I don't know, North America? I don't know, where, why do we have to, you know, that there's a joke that originally we're supposed to go to Canada. But Moshe Rabbeinu used to stutter. So instead of going to Canada, he said, K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-K-
He, first of all, he was a doctor. Second of all, he was a merchant. He was a, a very rich merchant. He had everything that you can, anything that you would possibly want, status, fame. And he, at some point, packed it up, left everything behind just to go to Eretz Israel. And you can go into history how many people, you know, even Rambam, Rambam didn't get to learn, live in Eretz Israel, Maimonides. He lived in Spain, he lived in Egypt. And he says, at least let me die in Eretz Israel. If I can't even die, let me be buried in Eretz Israel. The famous story is that he died in Egypt and they didn't know where to bury him. They put the coffin on a camel and he says, wherever the camel stops, that's where you bury me. And the camel went in all the way to Tveria and stopped. That's where he got buried. So Rambam says, if I can't live in Eretz Israel, at least let me be buried in Eretz Israel. And Bemet, the list is, psh, we can sit here the whole morning talking about the greatest of all, what they did just to come to the land of Israel. The Baal Shem Tov and so many people, Rabbi Nachman from Breslev, everything, just let me put my, my foot here. You know, even to, uh, to according to al what the Rambam says, that a person that lives in Eretz Israel is not allowed to live in Eretz Israel. This is a halacha. You know, people make vacations, they go out of Eretz Israel. They should consult with the rabbi if you're allowed even to live Eretz Israel. According to halacha, we're not allowed to live Eretz Israel. Rambam, th there is a story, I don't know how much it's backed up, but there is a story, and it's sourced back to Rambam, that he had a certain uh, igeret, a certain letter, that he wrote on it, Ani ben Moshe, I am the son of Moshe, I am Moshe, the son of Maimon, uh, 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 every day I'm doing three sins, what's called over belav, a certain uh, uh, sin, a negative sin that I'm not allowed to do and I'm doing it and one of them is that I live out of Eretz Israel. So Rambam knew that he's actually going against the halacha and he lives outside of Eretz Israel. Now you're allowed to leave Eretz Israel for a few things. You're allowed to leave Eretz Israel to learn Torah. You're allowed to leave Eretz Israel to find the Shidduch, to, to get married. You're allowed to live in Eretz Israel to go and save another Jew, but just to walk around or for shopping or vacation, or, I don't know, you have to ask a rabbi before you go on a vacation. There's beautiful places to go in Israel for a vacation, you're not going to have to go anywhere else. But nevertheless, one should know that the halacha, the oral law says you're not allowed to live in Eretz Israel. Now, on the other hand, the, the list is so long, we're going to stop here, by the way, with the list, but the list is so long of how many people were for Eretz Israel. but there is one person, he's actually he lived here in Sfat, he's buried here, maybe if, on your tour you're going to go and look uh, at his synagogue and his grave, the Al-Sheikh, but he comes and kind of questions, wait a minute, I don't understand, what's the big deal with you telling me about Eretz Israel? Why? What's so, what's so special here? He's the first one that it's First of all, he lived here. That's not the issue. But he was posing a certain question. What's the big deal with Eretz Israel? His name is Moshe Al-Sheikh. He lived here in Sfat about 400 years ago. He, he was born, I believe, in 1506 and died in 1600. So we're talking about 450, 420 years ago that he lived here in Sfat. There's a shul, the Al-Sheikh shul here. He was the student of Yosef Karo and the, the rabbi that wrote the Shulchan Aruch, the Bet Yosef. And he was the rabbi of the famous Rabbi Chaim Vital. Later on, the Rizal came into Tzfat, and the Rabbi Chaim Vital became the student of the Rizal. But the al Sheikh was the rabbi, the rabbi of the Rabbi Chaim Vital, the famous successor of the Rizal. Nevertheless, he lived here in Tzfat, and he said, I see four things that I don't understand. One is Eretz Israel is so different, from any other place that will stop me from serving Hashem in this land or any, anywhere else. And he was the first one who kind of approached it. And he said as follows, first of all, the first thing is what's called mitzad ha'adam, coming from the man himself. The man, the quality of the human, the quality of the Jew is equal in Eretz Israel like in any other country. It's not that if you move from New York to Israel, suddenly you become Superman. You're the same human wherever you live. What's the big difference if I live in Tel Aviv or if I live in, I don't know what, Los Angeles? When it comes from my point of view, I'm exactly equal. Doesn't matter what, where you put me. You know, in my short lifetime, I lived in so many different places. I lived in North America, in, Canada, in America, in Canada, in Europe, in Australia. I lived in so many places. I'm the same alone wherever you put me. 
So what's the difference where I am? The second thing is, is the land itself. Have you ever touched the soil here in Israel? Is it different from the soil anywhere else? It is, but nevertheless, to the naked eye, you look, you look at the land, it looks like the same thing. It doesn't look like something is different here. The third thing is what's called the mazalot, the zodiac. And he looked, the al-sheikh, in the mazalot, in the zodiac, in the signs, he says, I don't see any difference how it's affecting the land here or here. And the fourth of all is with Hashem. Is Hashem different when you go to a different place in the world? Hashem is equal in Israel, or America, or Asia. Hashem is, doesn't change. So he's posing four questions. What's the big deal of Dafka specifically being here in Eretz Israel? Because if you go through this list, take me, or you, or anybody else, you are the same person wherever you're going to go. And the land itself, you know, you grow tomato in Israel, you also grow tomatoes in America. You build things in the land, you build everywhere. What's the big difference? Okay, you're 100% right. The soil in Israel is very, very powerful. But nevertheless, talking to the naked eye. And of course, like I told you, the zodiac and Hashem. Wherever you go, Hashem is the same. I travel all the time. Every six weeks I travel. I pray in any synagogue that I go. Prayers are the same. Hashem is everywhere. Everywhere that you go, the Kadosh Buhu is present there. So again, now we're back to the same question. What's the big deal with this land? Why are we so attached to this land? Why do we have to be here? What's the, the secret in this little piece of land that everybody wants? And it belongs to us. So before we're going into the explanation, I have to uh, uh, publicly apologize for what I'm about to say. And I'm about to quote the Talmud. Don't turn it against me. I had already classes that I read out from a book and I was attacked for what I'm saying. What do you want from me? I'm reading the book. So I'm going to quote a piece of the Talmud. And I'm already apologizing to any person that lives outside of Eretz Israel. And I'm quoting the Talmud. Please do not stone me. It says in Tractate Ketuvot, in page 110, Kuf Yud, Better to live in a city full of idol worship in Eretz Israel than to live in any city outside of the world that is full of observant Jews. This is just the beginning. And I'll repeat it. The Talmud says, better to live here in Israel. Go now to Uvel Fachem. I don't know, go to anywhere. Go to a city that it's all idol worship. There's not even a synagogue there. But here in Israel? than to live in any other religious city anywhere in the world. I'm not going to quote names, chas v'shalom should not be lashon ara. But there's cities outside of Israel that there's almost more religious Jews than in Israel. I lived in New York. Some places there, they put Bnei Brak to shame. But the Talmud says, better to live here in Israel amongst idolatry and amongst idol worship than to live anywhere in the United States, even if it's in the biggest city of Torah in in the in in the, uh, wherever the, the city is in the country is now this is nothing the, the Gemara goes into more into depth there and it says any person and again i really apologize i know a lot of you don't live in israel but hopefully that will make you say wait a minute <laughs> maybe i should uh, apply to make aliyah but nevertheless the next thing the talmud says any person that lives out of israel is like he doesn't have a god that's a pretty harsh thing. The Talmud says any Jew that lives outside of Israel is like, he's like, I'm not connected to Hashem. Worse than an idolatry. I don't even have a God. Idolatry, at least I believe in something. I don't believe in any. Now what's the, what's the meaning of that? That the Talmud says something so harsh that a person, a Jew, that lives outside of Israel, that he doesn't have a God. He doesn't believe in the God of Israel. Now, another thing that the Talmud adds, any person who lives outside of Israel is like an I, I, idolater, an, I, I, does idolatry. Why? You're talking about millions of people as we speak. I'm not talking about now in the history. As we speak, there are millions of Jews outside of Israel. Hundreds of thousands of them are beyond observant and amazing Jews. The Talmud calls them idolatries. 
and they're doing Avodah Zarah and they don't have a God, but if the Talmud says something, there's something to it. Needless to say that, first of all, it's not so clear why is the Talmud saying such a thing. First of all, don't forget that the one who stated that lived outside of Israel. This is in the Talmud, the Babli Talmud. He lived in Iraq. And he says that. But nevertheless, it's not so clear because most of the Jews live outside of Israel. You know, this is completely off the subject, but if you would ask almost any person, they'll tell, and you'll ask them how many Jews are in the world, they'll tell you about 15, 16 million. I don't know who takes on himself this responsibility that counted the Jews, that says how many Jews are out there, 15 or 16, maybe 16 and a half. What do you mean, you started counting people? To my humble opinion, we're about 200 million Jews in the world as we speak. That's my humble opinion. And you know, there's probably even more because most Jews don't even know they're Jews. You know, many people outside the world, they think that they're non-Jews and they're Jews. And I spoke about it numerous times in many of my classes. How many Jews, as we speak, they don't even know they're Jewish. I believe we're easily 200 million Jews. We have about maybe 15 to 20 that they know that they're Jewish. Besides the fact that many that think they're Jewish, they're not even Jewish. But just look at history. You know how many Jews 500 years ago in the Spanish Inquisition they pretended not to be Jewish. They say that today every seventh Spaniard in Spain is Jewish. You're talking about a population of about 48 million people. You're talking about 7 million Jews in Spain. They don't even know they're Jewish. How about in the Holocaust? How many people were hiding their babies in churches and places? In Russia, how many people lived? You know any stories? I can tell you now, a long, uh, three weeks of stories of people that just found out that they're Jewish out of nowhere. I can tell you firsthand that about a hundred years ago, my, my family side, my father's family side, they come from Lebanon and Syria. And they, they're from Syria. And about a hundred years ago, they moved to Lebanon because that's where it like, was the high society, where that's where rich people went to live. They moved from Syria to Lebanon. Nevertheless, my great-grandfather's brother had a daughter that she was kidnapped. It was a very popular thing, unfortunately that they would, the Jewish girls will get kidnapped all the time. Why? They believe it's a better quality. And she got kidnapped. At the time, she was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 years old. It wasn't like today, police. Eh, the child disappears, now go find the child. And they, uh, they came to terms, okay, they stole the child. What can you do? They looked for her, no, nothing. A few years later, one of the family members was a merchant. He found her in Jordan. But she was already married with kids. Now, this is not like today that you can come and start filing for legal way. You go now, talk to somebody the wrong way, they'll cut your head off. But nevertheless, he found her in Jordan with kids already. So you know what that means? It means that I have cousins in Jordan. Why? Because she had kids, and they had kids, and they had kids, and they had kids. And probably across the border, you have tens of thousands of stories like that. <laughs> and you know what? And they think they're uh, Muslims. I probably have cousins. They're called Muhammad and Ahmed. And, uh, and you know how many stories are like that? Oh, there's numerous, numerous of stories. Remind me to tell you throughout your visit here about some stories. There's one person who came here to Tzfat, an Arab from Ramallah, thinking he's an Arab. He's the great-great-grandson of Rabbi Shlomo el Kabetz, the author of Lecha Dodi. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of stories. So to my humble opinion, we're, we're not 15 million. We're easily, easily 200 million like that. That's what I think with a very quick calculation. I'm not talking right now about the lost tribes. I'm talking about even three, 400 years back. Let's go all the way back to the Spanish Inquisition, 500 years. How many people hid themselves just in Russia? Hundreds of thousands of people hid in, in basements. Just to, and, and so to say, no, we don't want to look like Jews. So I know I took like a little bit of a detour, but... Why would the person in the Talmud say that any person who lives outside of Eretz Israel is idolatry? The majority of the Jews don't live in Eretz Israel right now. What do we have in Eretz Israel? Six and a half million people. Even if you go by the, the, the average count, 16 million. So you have much more outside of Israel. So more people, Jewish, great Jews, amazing people. The Talmud calls them of De Avodah Zarah, the idolaters. Why would the Talmud say such a thing? So... Just from this quote, 
you understand that Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, is not just some land that you acquire. This is just some land that you put some money and you buy. This is a land that is very, very, very deeply connected to us in our root. It's not, not just a piece of uh, real estate. Now, again, we're back to the same question. What's so special about this land? What is this uh, mystical part that is connecting us into this small piece of land? Now, now it's, by the way, small, by the way. When Mashiach is going to come very soon, you'll see right away how we expand. Because biblically, our borders, they go all the way up to Turkey, into Syria, into Jordan, part of Iraq. This is the, the biblical Israel. I'm not talking about after all, after that we are also going to expand. And I'm not talking about the, play, the parts that the King David conquered. I'm just biblically, the land of Israel is much, much bigger. But nevertheless, again, we're stuck with this question. What's, the, what's this deal with this land here? So, first of all, we have to understand and we have to see how special the land is in the eyes of Hashem. Let's go back to the parasha that is called Bechukotai. Hashem says, if you're going to walk in my path, we just read that a few weeks ago. I will give you whatever you want. Just follow my rules. I will give you wealth and happiness and success and anything. But if you go against me, Hashem <laughs> what we read if we go against Hashem. One of the things that Hashem says there, that he's going to kick us out of our land, but nevertheless there'll be a promise. And this you can find in Parashat Bechukotai, this is in the book of Vaikra, chapter, 30, th chapter 26, verse 32. Go and read it, what it says there. I will read it to you. I'll save you the, 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 the hassle. But there's a certain promise there. Hashem says, yeah, you go against me, I'll kick you out of your land. But the land will stay faithful to you. Anyone that will come to live on this land will not benefit from this land. And we saw it with our own eyes. We were kicked out of here 1915 years ago. For 1950 years, anybody who came to this land, nished, nothing, nothing worked here. The Romans, the Greeks, the Italians, the, anybody who came here, nothing. We came back here, two, three years, look what we did here. So it's not necessarily us, could be the land. But nevertheless, there is a promise from the Kadosh Bechu that the land will be faithful to us. It says in Parashat Bechukotai, I will make the land desolate. So it will become desolate of your enemies who live in it. Nobody will benefit from this land. If I can benefit, nobody will. That's how we see that the land is so dear to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, That Hashem says, this land is special. Nobody can do anything they want on this land without my special permission. Not too long ago I heard about a story. About a certain rabbi, it's a real story, it's not, not, not a joke. I know all the jokes starts there was once a rabbi. But this is a real story of a certain rabbi who went to some whatever, uh, a trip to the United States, and on the plane there were about a hundred priests that came to visit Israel. And one of them started questioning him and telling him, what's so special with you in this land that we, we, he, the, this priest told him, we went now on a tour in the land of Israel, and the last, last visit this morning before we went on the plane was for Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Museum. And he says to him, I don't understand. Forget about building an empire here. You did it three years after coming out of death camps. How is it possible? How can you do such a thing? In history of mankind, nothing like this can happen. People are coming out, out of death camps, skinny like skeletons, gathered from all over the world. They don't even have an army. Forget about winning a, a huge war. They're building an empire within a couple of years. How is it even possible? So we see that the land of Israel, forget about us right now, the land of Israel belongs to the Kadosh Baruch Hu and it's his, uh, is the, how do you say, the pupil of the eye? I don't know how you say it in English. The apple of the eye. Shem says, oh, 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 don't touch this land. This is very, very dear to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And you know, the grandson, the grandson of Maimonides, Ramban, he says that the land will not accept our enemies. En arzenu mekabelet oivenu. Doesn't matter who will conquer this land, the land will throw out whoever conquered here. Any nation that conquered Israel was destroyed one way or another 
a few years later. Nobody sustained on this land. And you know, the Rambam says that there are two points here that are very, very important. There's actually three points where we see that the Torah is very, that, that the land of Israel is very, very unique to the Kadosh Baruch What are these three points? The Torah, first of all, says that the land of Israel belongs to the Kadosh Baruch It's called Eretz HaKodesh, the Holy Land. It's not the land that belongs to us. People think that the, the nation of Israel owned the land. We don't own anything. We are just uh, allowed to be here. But the land of Israel, this is called Eretz HaKodesh, the land of holiness, this belongs to the Kadosh Baruch That's what the Torah says. But, there are, like I said, there are three things that show how special this land is. One of them is the Torah clearly says this land belongs to Hashem. The second thing is, can be found in a, a, a very special haftarah on the most holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, we read what's called Maftir Yonah. This is the most famous haftarah. Anybody who wants to be rich goes and buys that for thousands of dollars. Some synagogues around the world, the people are bidding, are, are uh, auctioning for hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the aliyah from Maftir Yona. This is a remedy to become very, very rich. I know a rabbi that he tells me on Yom Kippur and Moncha, I go and wake up all the, the businessmen because everybody, they all want to uh, donate to auction, to go up to this aliyah. But nevertheless, very, very powerful Aftara. The first Yom Kippur of my observant life, I became observant when I was 28. The first Yom Kippur that I celebrated, I questioned why are we reading this Haftara on Yom Kippur? From all the chapters in Tanakh, that's the one we're reading? What are we reading here? About a prophet that didn't want to listen to Hashem? And then you know what he did? He went to a city called Nineveh, was like kind of a New York, millions of people, and one Jew convinced about 12 million Gentiles to do tshuva. But nevertheless, the story is long, and I always question, why are we reading this on Yom Kippur? But let's, let's look at this parasha, at this haftarah. What's going on there? There's a Jewish prophet who lives in Tel Aviv, in Yafo. He lives in Israel, Yonah. He gets an SMS message, he gets a prophecy from Hashem, go and convince, go to Nineveh, go and convince them, I'm going to destroy the city, go and tell them to do tshuva. He says, I don't want this headache right now. You think I need to go now into an event and start telling them that they're going to be destroyed? You know what he does? He hops on a boat and he runs away from Yafo to a place called Tarjish. Where are you running? You think Hashem doesn't exist in Tarjish? You're running away from Hashem. What are you doing? What are you doing? It's, it's the same thing like you would run from the kitchen to the living room. Oh, you're going from, from here to here. You're running away from Hashem because you don't want to do the job. Just go out from your living room to the porch. That's the exact same thing what you're doing. So I'm sure you know the story. They go in the ocean, starts a storm. They throw him in the water. The whale eats him and so forth. He has a clinical death. He's dead for three days in the whale. The whale throws him up. He comes down. He has a near-death experience. Makes a YouTube channel and... <laughs> Some, some people got the joke. But nevertheless, <laughs> what are you running away from, Mr. Yonah? You think Hashem doesn't exist in Tarshish? You know what Yonah does? The Kuzari, we just spoke about Rabbi Yudah Levi. He explains it very, very nice. And he says something very special. There's no prophecy outside of Israel. No such a thing. All the prophecies are inside of Israel. The only time that there's a prophecy outside of Israel, it's about Israel. Look at the pattern of all the prophets. All the prophecies are in Israel. You can't have prophecy in a, in outside of Israel. You know why? There's no uh, antenna there. There's no reception. Sometimes you go with your phone to an area. There's no reception here. Now you come to visit. You have to change your SIM card. The only the, the reception works in Israel. There's no reception for prophecy outside of Israel. Yonah says, no problem. I'll go with there's no reception. Hashem can't call me there. He wasn't stupid. He didn't try to run away from Hashem. The Kuzari says, there's only prophecies in Eretz Israel. And yes, there were a few prophecies outside of Eretz Israel, but only about Eretz Israel. So Yonah makes a U-turn and he goes where there's no reception, outside of Israel, where Hashem can't bother him. 
So we see here the second virtue of this land, that only in this land there's connection to the world above. You want to have prophecy in Eretz Israel? Go out of Eretz Israel, you lose connection. So we have the first part that we say that is so uh, convincing and explaining to us the power of the Torah, of, of, of Eretz Israel. The first one, the Torah says, Eretz Israel belongs to Hashem. End of story. Nobody can take this land. Second thing, there's no reception here. There's no prophecy outside of Eretz Israel, only in Israel. Another thing that is teaching us how powerful Eretz Israel is, is if you look at our neighbors, I don't know if you notice, all our neighbors, they have natural resources of water. Israel is the only land in the middle that doesn't have a resource for water. We're depending on rain. Look at all the countries around us. Look at Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt. They all have water reservoirs. We don't. Why is that? You ever thought about that? Just look around. You don't have to be here a scientist. Look around Eretz Israel. All the countries around us, they don't need rain. They have their own source of water. We're the only one who needs rain. Why? Because Hashem wants us every year to pray for rain. Hashem says, you're going to pray. You're not going to get it for free. For our neighbors, He says, you get it for free. Here's water. I don't want to hear about I don't want to hear from you. For the Jews, He says, no, you're going to pray every day. Every year you're going to pray for rain. I'm sure you heard the famous story slash joke that on the sixth day of creation, Hashem gathered all the creatures and says, listen, we created a beautiful world. Look what the great job that we did. But today we're creating the Bechir, the supreme of all creation. We're about to create man. Ooh, wow. And more than that, I'm going to place him in the best place on the entire planet. In Eretz Israel. In Halamoria. It's going to be in the center of the, This is going to be the, the best of all places. That's where I'm going to put this creature. Nevertheless, Hashem is praising and praising Adam Arishon, and at some point the angels came and says, don't you think you're giving him a little bit too much? He's the top of all creatures. He's in the land that belongs to you. Isn't it giving him a little bit too much? So Hashem says, wait till you see who he's going to be his neighbors. So, so our neighbors, <laughs> they have no problem with water. We have problem with water. I know you think we have the Kineret, but the Kineret without what rain is worthless. We are depending on rain. Why? Because Hashem says, I want you to pray every day and every year for rain. You're not going to get nothing for free. Now, comes here a big question. And before I ask the question, let's just summarize the three points that are explained What's so unique about this land? So I told you, first of all, the Torah states it belongs to Hashem. Second of all, there's no reception outside of Israel. Prophecy is only in Israel. And the third is that we have to pray to God in this land for rain. There's no problem of rain in America, by the way. I don't know how it is in South Africa, but in America, there's no problems of rains and many other places. But nevertheless, comes a big question here. Why do we constantly have to pray for Hashem's assistance in this land? In this land, I'm not talking about outside of the land. So, there's a story that there was once a king, and he had two ministers that there were his right and left hands. And they grew up with him from kindergarten. They grew up with him in school, in college, everywhere. But it happened to be that he was appointed to be the king, so he appointed both of them to be his right and left hand. One of them became the minister of defense, the other one became the minister of foreign affairs. Okay, they were best friends. One time the king goes on a journey, when he comes back, oh, he gets the bad news. Both of his best friends, the ministers, went against him. They had codes to everything, they took money, they did a lot of broad, bad things. Now he has to put them on trial. Now his, his best friends, he loves them more than anything, but he has to punish them. And the whole land is looking, the media, everything. So for the minister of defense, he says, listen, I love you more than anything, you're my best friend. I don't want to really punish you, but I have to punish you. I'm punishing you to be exiled from this land. But here's a $50 million check. Wherever you go, deposit the check. You're set for life. I might not see you, but you're good. 50 million is enough. He comes to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and he tells him, listen, I don't want to punish you like I punished the other one. I'm going to give you a different punishment. You're staying here in this land. 
but you're going to keep on working for me without a salary. Once a month, you have to come to me and beg me for money and plea your case why I have to give you some money. Okay, they both leave the room. The minister of defense tells the other guy, <laughs> see, he loves me more. He says, no, he doesn't. He says, of course he loves me more. Look, he gave me $50 million and he sends me off to a faraway land. The other guy, the minister of foreign affairs says, you fool, he doesn't like you. He shut you up, he gave you money and he sent you away. Me he loves, he left me close to him. And he wants me to come and see him every month. Every month he says, now you have to come to me to ask for your maskoret, for your livelihood. So we see the exact same thing. The Lord Shavu says, you know, people think that there are other nations, they got everything. Oh, Kadosh Baruch sent them far away with a lot of money. And he says, here, I'm going to put you close to me. And I want you to come all the time and ask for rain. That's just you'll be close to me. So Kadosh Baruch constantly wants a certain kesher, a certain connection with us. If, in case you haven't noticed, we pray three times a day. Why do you have to pray three times? I remember that was the first question I asked when I became observant. My friend told me, you have to pray. I said, okay, no, why don't we pray on Rosh Hashanah? And he told me, no, three times a day. Three times? Well, one is not enough. The same thing over and over? Yeah, because Hashem wants a connection with us. Nevertheless, sorry to tell you, we're still back to first question. So what's the whole big deal with this land? What's the big thing with Eretz Israel? Why the land of Israel? Why are we so limited in the small land? Why couldn't we get another land? Why are we limited that we can't be anywhere we want to be? I want to be here right now. I want to be in New York. I don't want to be in New York, but I want to be anywhere in the world. Why do I have to be limited in this land, Afka? Why? We're still in this question. I'm going to tell you a short story about the son of the Baba Sali. His name is Meir Abu Hatzera. Rabbi Sali was a great tzaddik, came from Morocco. And his son, Meir Abu Hatzera, lived in Morocco too. And somewhere in the 50s, later on he came to Eretz Israel, but somewhere in the 50s or the 60s, a Jew came to him and told him, Rabbi, I want a blessing to go to Eretz Israel. The rabbi told him, I'm giving you a blessing, go to Eretz Israel. He tells but there's only one problem. I don't know how to read Hebrew, and I don't know how to write Hebrew. Can I still go to the land of Israel? The rabbi told him, yes. Not only that you're going to go, the fact that you don't speak, that the fact that you don't read or write Hebrew will be a blessing for you in the land of Israel. Okay, the rabbi told him to do aliyah. He's doing aliyah. He packs his bags, go to Eretz Israel. He knows a little bit how to speak. He doesn't know how to read and write. Okay, what do you do the first thing when you land in Eretz Israel? You need a job. So he goes to the labor department, to the, to the office of uh, jobs, where you get a job, he signs up. Okay, who's sitting there? People who just went out of university, they need jobs. He doesn't even know how to read and write. He sits in front of the clerk, okay, what's your qualifications? He says, well, I don't have much qualifications. And uh, out of nowhere, he just throws out, he says, I don't even know how to read and write. <gasps> And then he says, what a mistake I did. I just told the person that I need to get a job that I don't know how to read and write. He says, what a mistake. Okay, the person says, okay, sign here, we'll be in touch with you. He goes home, what did I do? Why did I tell the, per the clerk that I don't know how to read and write? I'll never find a job. Okay, the next day he gets a phone call. Please go to what's called Misrad the, Bitachon, the defense uh, industry. And you have an interview there. You know, it is to work for Misrad Abitachon. The Misrad Abitachon is the, 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 the minister of security. And they have in Israel, we have Baruch Hashem, a very uh, large industry in the military. We have the Tasya Aviri, the, the air uh, uh, industry, making missiles and all sorts of engines to jets. And, and anyways, the, the army has a very big development here in Israel. And it's called Misrad Abitachon. This is the best job you can get, by the way. They tell him, go to an interview in Misrad Abitachon. He thought it's a joke. He goes to Tel Aviv, and he walks in, of course, very big security till he goes in. And then they sit him in some room. He sits there and sits and sits, and he's going out of his mind from boredom. 
He's already sitting there for like five hours. He's like, I think this was a mistake. I think somebody was joking with me. And he's about to get up and leave. Somebody walks out. Okay, sir, you're ready to go in to your interview. Okay, he sits inside. And they tell him, uh, they ask him a few questions. And then they tell him, we have a job. We have a secret factory for weapons. And this is a true story, by the way. It's not a joke. You're looking like it's a joke. It is a, what's the punchline? So it's a true story. Okay, they tell him we have a secret factory for weapons and we have a lot of documents, paper documents. We need somebody to shred them. But the thing is that we need somebody that doesn't know how to read and write, that so doesn't know what it says on the documents. <laughs> now you said that you don't know how to read and write. Now why should we we'll believe you? So I don't know if you noticed, we tested you in the waiting room. There was a lot of newspapers. You sat there for five hours, you didn't even pick up a newspaper. Yeah. And then finally, when you picked up the newspaper, you were holding it upside down. So we knew you don't know how to read. And he got this job. He was the shredder <laughs> of the documents of the secret, uh, comp uh, the secret factory of weapons. And he worked there all his life. And when he died, you know what it is, a pension of Misrada Bitachon, to get a pension from, the, from this... Uh, from this office, this government office, and then he saw the blessing of the tzaddik, the son of the Baba Sali, who told him, the fact that you don't know how to read and write in Israel will be a blessing for you. So, <laughs> I need the job too. You know, I heard not too long ago from a person, unfortunately, a few years ago, I'm sure you heard about the Girush from uh, Gush Katif, how they took a beautiful piece of land and they threw everybody out of there. And there was a, uh, a certain individual that I know who owned land there. And before they were thrown out, he actually sold some of the land to an Arab. And he called the Arab a few years later. No, how's everything doing? Is How's my land doing? He told him, Ach, I wish you all come back. He's like, since you left, nothing happens here. Whatever I put in the ground, nothing grows. Everything that I planted in the land, psh, nothing. I wish you all come back here. So, going back to this story with the land of Israel and what's so special and why do we need this uh, small piece of land, what's the idea behind the land of Israel? The land of Israel is a palace. It's the palace that belongs to Hashem. Hashem is a king and He needs a palace. And the land of Israel is the palace of Hashem. Now you know who do you see in the palace? You see the king. When you go to the palace, you know that a few weeks ago, maybe I'm off a few, a week or two, I don't know, but the president of the United States, he went to England. And all the media's pictures and videos of him and the queen, and you go to the palace, who do you see? The king. <laughs> That's how it is. Eretz Israel is the palace of Hashem. And when you go to the palace, you see the king. Eretz Israel, and some of you in this room, and many others, can uh, say how right I am. Eretz Israel is operating on miracles. Anybody who lives in Eretz Israel says everything here is a miracle. Nothing moves here that it's not a miracle. The wheels, if you would kind of have to paint or draw Eretz Israel, the wheels of this huge, huge place is a miracle. In Eretz Israel, you see the miracles on a daily basis. That's what everybody will tell you that. You know, go to the most secular person in Israel and ask him, how are you making money? Kadosh Baruch Hu. I'm not talking about religious people. I'm not talking to, telling you to go to Bnei Brak or to Yerushalayim. Go into any taxi here in Israel. The most simple person. How are you making money? Baruch Hashem. The Shem, Hashem sends money. Everybody in Israel sees that this land is operating on miracles. I'm not talking about now all the wars that we had here. And, oh, every, every day in Israel is living a miracle. Now in America, or any other place, there's miracles too. You don't see it. You don't see the miracles outside of Israel. And there are miracles every day. The same miracles probably. But in Israel, it's obvious. Parnassah here is a, is a miracle. The livelihood. Everything is a miracle here. You just open your eyes. You don't have to be a prophet. You see the miracles here. Now, if you go into our history, we have two holidays that are not biblical holidays. Of course, I'm talking about Hanukkah and Purim. Why do we celebrate them? Because we had a miracle. Two miraculous holidays. In Hanukkah was a huge miracle, and in Purim was a huge miracle. 
In Hanukkah, any blind person can see the miracle. Rabim ul me'atim. We were nothing. We were a few men against a huge army. And we won. This any, a child will see it's a miracle. In Purim, who can see the miracle? Can you see a miracle here? We just read that a few months ago. Even Hashem's name is not even in the, in the Megillah. Can you see a miracle in Purim? It was a political maneuver. We had a queen, <laughs> a woman, in the palace. She knew how to manipulate the situation. Made a party every day. That's it. What's, it? What's the miracle here? Can you see a miracle here? No. No, the oil was Hanukkah. So we have two miraculous holidays in our nation, in our history. One was Purim, one was Hanukkah. The one that the miracle was obvious, Hanukkah, where did it happen? Eretz Israel. The one that you don't see a miracle, where did it happen? In Iran, in Persia. I don't know if you notice, for the ones of you who are a little bit more observant, you notice that in Hanukkah we say eight days Hallel. Do we say Hallel on Purim? <laughs> Not even once. Why? You can't say Hallel, a praise to Hashem on a miracle that happened outside of Eretz Israel. So on Hanukkah, eight days we say Hallel, because the miracle happened in Eretz Israel, a very obvious miracle. Purim we don't. Same equal miracle. Outside of Israel you don't see the miracle. Now we can start understanding the quote of the Talmud that says that any person that lives outside of Israel is Zoveda Vodazara. Is it like an idolatry? Because in outside of Israel, the challenge of serving Hashem is way bigger. Way, way bigger challenge to serve Hashem outside of Israel. The reason why they say in the Talmud that a Jew outside of Israel is Zoveda Vodazara is because outside of Israel, the temptation for any type of idolatry is much, much bigger. And the idolatry in our generation is not to bow down on the floor. You know what it means idolatry in Hebrew? Avodah zara. Avodah zara. Zara means foreign. Anything that is foreign to me is avodah zara. I don't need to bow down to a statue. And you see that outside of Israel, the biggest idolatry is money, power, control. Physicality, indulgence, luxury. You don't have that in Israel. Okay, a very small portion, they live here in luxury. You don't see BMWs in the street. Well, here and there. You don't have that in Israel. Outside of Israel, there's a certain drive. I have to make more money. I have to be successful. I have to be rich. Because everybody's rich around me. Everybody has money. You don't have that in Israel. The idolatry of outside of Israel is what's going on around. It's much more, so to say, accessible than in Israel. You know, in the last maybe six years, one of my main things of doing is to push people to go to Eretz Israel. Of course, to make people more observant, to make people closer to Hashem. But one of my biggest, uh, biggest uh, efforts to push people to do Eretz Yisrael. Hashem, we were successful. Thousands of families were able to push to Eretz Yisrael. And I never tell people, listen, your life will be better. Lefech, I tell other people, you're leaving now your status. You're going to live in a much smaller house. You're not going to have a fancy car. You're going up in your level. You know what it says when you, do, when you go to Eretz Yisrael? You do Aliyah. Aliyah means you ascend. You go out of Israel, it's Yerida. You go down. And many people, even in our day, they live everything they have. They live good jobs, they live money, they live wealth, and they live here, I wouldn't say poverty, but they're, so they don't have a Mercedes. They live a little bit less. But the thing is that I see it with my own eyes. I travel all the time, and I told you, my main agendas, my main campaign is to push people to go to Eretz Israel for many different reasons. A, we're going to talk about it on Thursday. A, there's nowhere safe in, in everywhere in the, in the world for Jews anymore. People think they're safe. Now you see it in front of your eyes. The Kadosh Baruch is already exposing it in such an obvious way. Look at the anti-Semitism going in America. It's 300% higher every month it jumps. Hashem is already showing everybody you're not safe anywhere. There's no any safe place to Jews around the world but Eretz Israel. 
Regardless that the more Jews in Eretz Yisrael right now hastens the Geulah. The more mitzvot done in Eretz Yisrael, faster Mashiach will come. There's a lot of reasons why we need to be here. But it's the time for us to be here. For everybody. And I see, I go to many places in America, people don't want to, don't want to leave. Because they have money, they have status, they have nice cars. It's all one fake, big fake balloon, by the way. There's nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I went now not too long ago to America. I was in Los Angeles, in a place where everybody seems like they have a lot of money. If you're looking from the outside, everybody looks rich. Beautiful cars, beautiful jewelry and clothes, fancy vacations. Systematically, one by one, everybody told me. I was there for 10 days. Hundreds of people came and whispered in my ear, listen, I don't know what to do. My house is in foreclosure. I don't have money to pay my bills. I have debts, $300,000 on credit cards. I don't have money. I don't know. Everybody just saw one big show. Outside of Eretz Yisrael, the pool to idolatry is much, much easier than in Eretz Yisrael. Yeah, Eretz Yisrael is simple. People are simple. Everything is simple here. You're much more connected to the Kadosh Baruch You see Hashem in front of you. Outside of Israel, like this, you fall into any type of idol worship. And idol worship is not to bow down to a statue. You run after money, fame, power, success, a beautiful car, beautiful house. That's idolatry. You know how many times I tell people to live where they are? Oh, what am I going to do in Israel? How am I going to find a job there? You know that the economy in Israel is a better economy than anywhere in the world? It's such nonsense. I've seen with my own eyes thousands of people move to Eretz Israel. Thousands. I see a pattern that has never changed. The ones who come to Eretz Israel, they do Aliyah, and they come with the utmost uh, 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 trust in Hashem, everything works out right away. The ones who come iffy, with a little bit of a doubt, those things are hard. But the ones who just leave everything behind and they say, I trust Hashem, everything is just open in front of them. Better jobs, better everything. Everything is better in Israel. When we made Aliyah, I, I'm, 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 I'm Israeli. I was born in Israel. After the army, I left Israel. 18 years I lived in America. I feel like I'm a, a, I'm a Yaakov. I left Israel. I went to Haran, to America. I found my wife. He brought back four wives. I only bought one. And one is enough. He brought 12 kids. I brought six. I went to Haran. I did what I needed to do. And I came back to Eretz Israel. Four years ago. And there's nothing outside of Israel. I'm telling you, when I did apples to apples, and I compared everything that we had in America and what we have here, you can't even compare it. You can't compare nothing to Israel. People, exactly like the spies, talk Lashon Arab about Eretz Israel. How dare you talk Lashon Arab about Eretz Israel? It's the best place for a Jew to live in. We are so lucky that we have the land of Israel. 70 years ago, we were lucky enough that the Kadosh Baruch Hu opened his heart and started bringing us back here. Kibbutz Galuyot, the gathering of the Jews from all corners of the world. How dare you speak Lashon Arab about Eretz Israel like the spies did? They spoke Lashon Arab about Eretz Israel. No problem, you're going to die in the desert. You're not going to even see Eretz Israel. I see so many people that they're stuck in such a klipa, a spiritual husk outside of Israel. What are we going to do there? It's dangerous there. Okay, so once in a blue moon, there's a stabbing there. There's 1,500 stabs in Chicago, in New York every day. You hear you complaining about a stabbing here and there? I'm afraid. When I go to America, I'm more afraid there. I was in London a few months ago. I was there on Shabbat. There's a main street there. There's two big communities there. Gold is green and Hendon. I stayed in Hendon. There's a main street there. There's maybe 40 shuls there. Every shul, armed soldiers, commandos there with, with machine guns, helmets, out of, outside of every shul. I was like, what's going on here? I don't, have, I don't have soldiers outside of synagogues here. And people tell me it's dangerous in Israel. It's dangerous anywhere else. When I go out of Israel, I'm scared of my life. People talk to Shonar about Israel. There's nothing to do there. Eretz Ochrelet Yoshevea. The land is eating its t people. Okay, so people here are a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, short-tempered. Big deal. The thing is that outside of Israel, it's very easy to fall into this idolatry that everything is nice. I have a big house. I have a big job. I have a big this and a nice car. It's all fake. There's nothing there. And you very easily, like this, you fall into the idolatry of where you are. Of, I want to be here. You know that 80% of the Jews didn't leave Mitzrayim. 80% of the Jews saw miracles and didn't leave Mitzrayim. You know why? 
Because when they asked Moshe Rabbeinu, where are you taking us? He says, I'm going to take you to the desert. We're going to get the Torah. You know what they asked him? Is there Wi-Fi in the desert? <laughs> no. Oh, no, 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 Wi-Fi. I'm, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> Can't charge my iPhone. I'm sorry. I'm staying back in Mitzrayim. Yeah, that's what's going on right now in the world. That's what's going on right now. People live outside of Israel and they don't understand where they live. That's why the Talmud says a person lives outside of Israel is Kyoved Avodazara. No Kedusha outside of Eretz Israel. There's no holiness. And only in Eretz Israel is Kedusha. Outside of Israel is a challenge to serve Hashem. In Israel, it's straight in front of your face. Not only that, in outside of Israel, you are, people get addicted to their jobs, to their status, to whatever it is. You don't have that in Eretz Israel. And in Israel, you see the miracle right in front of your eyes. You don't see that anywhere else. In Israel, the supervision, the hashgacha, is much greater than any other place. You know, I gave a lecture not too long, a few months ago in America, about how, how the situation is in the world. And I was explaining how there's going to be a huge war before Mashiach comes. The war has already started. Gogu Magog. We can't get away from this, uh, this war. First of all, it started already. It's 30 kilometers from here. I don't know if you heard. Oh, yesterday night, all night, the jets are flying. All night. I don't know if you hear it. People are numb here. They don't even listen. The whole night, jets were flying. Your drones were all over Tzfat, and jets were flying all night. There's 30 kilometers. Hold on, 30 kilometers from here, there's a massive war. There are aircraft carriers 30 kilometers here in the water. Nuclear submarines. All the armies of the world are here fighting. There's a massive war. And I was telling people, you know, the lecture was in America. I told them the only safe place is Israel. The only safe place. No, no, you think some other place is safe? The only safe place is Eretz Israel. And Hashem is already showing to us how anywhere you go, you're not safe. Not only talking about anti-Semitism. Hashem has reached everywhere in the world. The only place where we're going to be safe is the land of Israel. You know, when World War I started, they went to the Chafetz Chaim. What should we do? The Chafetz Chaim told them then, Eretz Israel is the only safe place. Some were smart and they ran away to Eretz Israel. So when we want to conclude the idea behind the land of Israel, first of all, we have to understand the land belongs to the Kadosh Bukho. The land of Israel is the palace of Hashem. And here in the palace, you can see the king every day. Not only that, we have the honor to come here. Anywhere else in the world, this parasha is a very, very applicable to our times because people live outside of Israel and they think, no, I'm fine where I am. No, you're not. Wrap it up. Pack your bags and that's, now it's time to come here. Doesn't matter what you do, where you are, what's your job. I always, always throw back, go 80 years ago. I told you in the beginning of the class, my father's family is from Syria, from Lebanon. My mother's family is from Germany. They ran away from Germany the night before Kristallnacht. They were multimillionaires in Berlin, multimillion. My great-grandfather was a gazillionaire there. I have pictures that he had in, his, in the 30 convertible Mercedes in the, in the streets of Berlin. My grandmother, I'm not talking about now 500 years ago, my grandmother that I saw with my own eyes, she only died a few years ago has pictures of how they had servants in their mansion. They were multimillionaires. And she told me the exact same thing. What do you think? People didn't come and warn us in the 30s. This guy's a cuckoo, ran away. People came in 34, 35, 36, 37, ran away. This guy's a coo a nut job. And she says everybody was saying, what are you talking about? We're safe here. This is our safe haven. Look at us. We have mezuzot on the door. We're walking in the street with a talit. And like this, everything turned around. Some smart people sold what they have and they wrapped it up and they left. Most people stayed with, with their money, with everything, till the last moment and the last moment was one moment too late. My great-grandfather was so well connected that the night before Crystal Nacht, he gets a phone call from a secret, secret service, secret police officer who just told him, run away, hung up the phone. He goes home, he packs a bag, that's all you can take, a bag. No credit cards, no money transfer, no nothing. In the bag, you know what's in the bag? A pair of tefillin, a talit, a menorah, candles, everything that is religious. He takes his three kids, my grandmother is one of them, and they run away. On the way, they stop in his mother's house. We're running away, the Germans are coming. She tells him, <laughs> nonsense, you run away, I'm staying here. Next day is Crystal Nacht, and they ran away to Denmark, to England, to Canada, to Australia. They were the only ones who saved. 
from being millionaires, living in the, in the best neighborhood in Berlin, they end up in Australia. My grandmother was a 17-year-old princess sewing buttons in a factory. They lost everything they had, but they didn't lose nothing. They lost maybe their money, but not their lives. And history repeats itself, and Hashem is showing us very obvious how he's preparing the next move. This time, we have Eretz Yisrael. Imagine we had Eretz Yisrael 80 years ago. We had Eretz Yisrael 80 years ago. Well, how many people came here? 20,000? 30,000? Okay, it wasn't so easy to come here. The point to say is that history repeats itself. We're going to have a class on Thursday about Mashiach. I know a lot of people are very blinded. They don't want to see the reality. Mashiach is coming any second. Mashiach is already here in Eretz Yisrael. By the way, because if he has to come tonight, it's a human being that is alive. He's here in Eretz Yisrael. He's not doing shopping right now in Fifth Avenue in New York. I'll guarantee to you that. The world is changing. And now we see in front of our eyes that this is where we belong. We don't belong anywhere else. Anywhere in the world. Look how much the anti-Semitism. Look how Hashem is. There's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with them. Hashem is telling us, move. Wrap it up. Now when you can. I'm telling you, I'm helping thousands of families to do Aliyah. Three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, it was easy to make Aliyah. You know that now, I was now, a few months ago, in April, in Florida. People are now trying to do Aliyah. It's hard to do Aliyah. The American government doesn't let you take money out of the country. They don't let you take money, your money out of the country. This is three months ago in Florida, in America. People tell me, I'm doing Aliyah. I can't take my money. I just sold my house. I can't take the money into Israel. Even to make Aliyah is becoming, becoming harder. So the writing is on the wall. You don't have to be a genius. Comes this parasha in a perfect timing and is telling me, this land is not some piece of real estate. This land belongs to the Kadosh Bechor. It's a holy land. This is the land that you see with your own eyes. Ask any Israeli. Miracles. You just see miracles in front of your eyes. Any person that lives here, that comes here, if they have faith in Hashem, you see the miracles in front of you. Everything is miraculous in this, city, in this land. And this is the sign for us, all Jews, it's time to come here. The more Jews in Eretz Israel, the safer we are, the more powerful we are. The more Jews performing mitzvot on the land of Israel hastens the redemption and will soften the redemption. And people are afraid, there's nothing to be afraid of. This is the only safe place in the world. 20 plus years ago was the, the Gulf War. Saddam Hussein were, were shooting scuds at us, not even one person died. One person died from a heart attack, not from the missiles. Scuds were falling here. I was there. I was, there. I was a 17-year-old teenager. Nothing happened. Nothing. And, and the same day that a missile was shot to Israel, a missile was shot into Saudi Arabia, killed there 500 people. Nothing happens in this land. Yeah, I know. On the surface, you see attacks and terror. And the, this is nothing to what's going on in America and many other places. Europe? I wouldn't even dare to go to Europe. So this is the most and only safe place for us here. It's time for everybody to be here. And the sooner you do it, the easier it will be. What, do you want to run away with a bag? Run away when you can, when you can easily sell your stuff, settle here. You know, for after I got married, we're talking about 16 years ago, my wife already said, let's go to Israel. I told her, no, no, let's stay a little bit here. We lived in America. For maybe 10 years, I was begging my rabbi, I want to go back to Israel. He says, no, 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 stay where you are. Because you, you know, you're doing a lot of outreach, you teach Torah, you have a lot of followers, a lot of students. Stay where you are. And every year I would beg him. A few years ago we went to Eretz Israel to my nephew's bar mitzvah. I came back. I was like, I had it up to here. I don't want to be here anymore. He told me, okay, now you're ready to go. And we wrapped it up. Baruch Hashem, I couldn't wait to come here. Oh, just, to, just to... What a relief. It was like I had a splinter in my back for 18 years. And when I landed here, ah... Oh, and I can tell you now another three days of miracles are how we came here. The point we want to take from that is that we see in front of our eyes in this week's parasha the only time that God did not forgive us is when we slandered the land of Israel. I'm not talking about right now the sin of Lashon Hara. That we'll talk another time. That's a whole different thing. But to talk Lashon Hara about the land of Israel? Uh, this is the proof. This is the parasha. The only time that Hashem doesn't forgive our sin. He forgave us in the golden calf. He forgave us in all the situations that happened in the desert. This, he says, no, 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 no. Here, you're talking about my land? That is not going to be forgiven.
So we have to take this and to understand that this is a gift that we have this land. That the Kadosh Baruch Hu is here. Now we have two groups now in our, in our nation. We have the group that live in Israel and the group that lives outside of Israel. <clears throat> For the ones who live in Israel, they say, okay, I'm already in Israel. What do you want me to do? Then when we move to Israel, it's called Aliyah. I'm sure you heard the term when you move to Israel. I'm doing Aliyah. Aliyah means to go up. Why going up? Israel is a very low place. And not only that, if I come from America, I know a person now that left a job in America, $150,000 a year job, beautiful house, be everything beautiful, he left. You think he's going to find a $150,000 job in Israel? <laughs> if he finds 10% from that, and you think it stopped him from coming? He told me, I want to raise my kids in Israel. I don't care what job I'm going to get. And you know what? They came with such emunah, such faith in bitachon. Two weeks he found already a job, a good job. It's not $150,000 a year. He doesn't need that. Who cares? So he doesn't have a BMW. Big deal. So the ones who live in Israel, how do they do Aliyah? Is that you ascend in your spiritual level constantly. You can't stand in the same place. Wherever you're standing in Israel, you have to have an Aliyah. Whatever you're doing today, tomorrow do more. The ones who are outside of Israel, then the, the, the conclusion is very simple. You do Aliyah. Yeah, I know it sounds scary and hard, and what am I going to do, and where, and what, my family, my... Oh, I heard, I heard all the excuses. Trust me. I heard all the excuses. My family here, my kids that need to finish college, my this, my dog, my neighbor. I heard all the excuses. <clears throat> but I also heard all the stories and testimonials of people 80 years ago that had the same excuses. And you know what? When it was time to run away, the borders were closed and they were thrown on trains. And a lot of people say, oh, no, no, never again. I don't know who came up with the slogan, never again. So what if we have the land of Israel? Never again. Yeah? So the point we want to take from here is the land of Israel belongs to Hashem. A, let's jump one step aside. Don't talk ever, Lashon HaRa, about Israel. Even if it's hard for you to make Aliyah, don't go back to where you come from and say Eretz Israel is horrible. It's hard there. No jobs, no money. It's all wrong. Don't talk Lashon HaRa about the land of Israel. Don't talk Lashon HaRa, period. That's the biggest disaster that we have is Lashon HaRa. <clears throat> lying and slandering. But about the land of Israel? Oh, I don't even think of talking. That's one thing. More than that, you're already in the land of Israel, you have to constantly ascend and do Aliyah. It's the easiest to grow here. <clears throat> but nevertheless, for the ones who live outside of Israel, then you start thinking, how am I moving? Because very soon you're going to move here anyways. Mashiach is coming here tonight or tomorrow or the next day or in a month or chas v'shalom in three months or half a year. You're going to come here anyways. You think you're going to stay where you are and Mashiach comes? No. You know they're preparing everything for us. Somebody sent me a drone, a video of a drone flying over cities in Syria. The cities are completely demolished. You know why? All you need is a few contractors going in there, painting the walls, and we have now neighborhoods over neighborhoods over cities for all the people who come from, from all over the world. We have where to put them. <clears throat> so hasten the redemption, come to Eretz Israel. And follow what the Torah says. We had the opportunity to go into, into Eretz Israel, and we neglected it, we ignored it, and we got punished. Forty years we were walking in circles in the desert. So I hope that at least it's from this parasha, the message is, besides the Lashon Ara, is to value what we have. We have the land of Eretz Israel. We have Eretz Israel. We didn't have it for 1950 years. We neglected it when we were here 2,000 years ago. We got kicked out of here. But now we have the land of Eretz Israel. This is a present that nobody else has. And this is the only safe place in the world. The only place for a Jew to be is in Eretz Israel. We are Am Israel, we belong into Eretz Israel. But Bezad Hashem, we should all merit to do an Aliyah. The ones who are local should do an Aliyah in spirituality that they go into a higher level. And the ones who are out of Eretz Israel should value what do we have here. We have here an oasis. I just gave you a short example. There are thousands, if not tens of thousands of people, of great tzaddikim, great sages that begging, let me come into this land. And we all, for us, it's all a plane ticket. And I can tell you already, a lot of people in their mind, yeah, I want to come to Eretz Israel, but how am I going to find a job? Kadosh Baruch has a lot of jobs. Kadosh Baruch has a lot of everything. People are afraid that they're not going to find a job here. 
You know the 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 rates of uh, of uh, unemployed in America. I don't know how it is in other places. Not in America, <clears throat> the rate of unemployment. You have nothing to worry about. This is the land where the eyes of Hashem are here from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. The Kadosh Baruch Hu is here. Here is where you see the King. As Ad Hashem, we should all gather in Eretz Yisrael before Mashiach comes. That will hasten the redemption, make the process of the redemption easier. And you already settle here in your land, in our land. You find your place here. We all have a place in this land and we're so lucky. We have to see how lucky we are that we even have the option. As Ad Hashem, we should all marry to come to Eretz Yisrael way before Mashiach comes. We should have it in Bechesed Verachamim. We should all marry to do Aliyah. Bezad Hashem, go back to the land that is promised to us for thousands of years and fulfill the prophecies and the promises. Bezad Hashem, we should all see you here in Eretz Israel, wherever you choose to live. Amen. <laughs>